Well, good morning again. Let's pray. That was awesome, was it not? Father, thank you so much for your presence with us. The creator of the universe has time for us, and we acknowledge you are present with us, and we are so thankful. As we open your word, the ideas that you wrote down 2,000 years before any of us were born, would you open our hearts and mind? Would you be our teacher today? We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hey, if we have not yet met, again, my name is Bill Rector. We're going to start in Luke chapter 6, Jerry. We are just, yeah, we're moving so fast. Yeah, it's, it's a breakneck pace here. Who knows, we might finish Luke in another location. <laughs> but no promises. Uh, well, it's what we do every week. If you're new here and you're visiting with us, thank you so much for coming. Every week we open God's Word. See, my ideas are not that good. Uh, just take a look at my wardrobe if you needed uh, any evidence of that. My wife is usually here and she can provide other evidence of things I've done. My ideas are not that good. God's ideas are timeless and transformative, and that's what we want to do. So that's what we do. We're going to open God's Word, and I'd like to direct you to Luke chapter 6, the first five verses of that. And let me read that to you, if I can here. Here we go. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And I want to spend some time, and like every week, let's go through and let's talk about this. What we've seen so far in the Gospel of Luke is Luke is telling us this story of Jesus. And in chapter 5, we saw some, let's just call them minor confrontations between Jesus and this group called the Pharisees, okay? The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, sometimes they're referred to as the scribes, the religious leaders, they represent a group, and we're going to need to make sure we understand who they are. But the religious leaders of the day, Jesus is having some minor confrontations. Within chapter 5, they started, and they were pretty minor. They were things where they observed Jesus doing stuff, and... Uh, they commented and Jesus commented back. Now, in chapter 6, it begins with one where Jesus is actually orchestrating this event. It's almost like he's going, I don't want to say on the offensive, because I don't believe Jesus was a pugilist. I don't think he was picked fights with people. But I do think he went out of his way to do this particular incident, knowing they were watching, knowing it would provoke a response. So he, this was proactive here. And why? Well, we, these Pharisees are the... the, the the people, you know, Jesus loves them too. And he wants, he wants to call them out of this lifestyle that they're leading, which is they've set up rules that they worship instead of worshiping God. That's the best way to describe them. And I think it's important for us to know we're susceptible to that. Right? God wants us to be in relationship to him, and so sometimes we as human beings set that up as rules to follow. We probably grew up, many of us in churches, thinking that. You were good if you did this. You were bad if you did this. And it's rules that you do, right? And, and Jesus is in opposition to that. God hates religion. And, and the idea is religion is this idea that by following a set of rules, some bucket list, you gain stature with God. It is not true. That does not happen. And however much Jesus loves these Pharisees and wants to call them out of that, he has anger for them and a confrontation with them that is more serious than any other group of people that I can tell in the Bible. Uh, and Jesus cast out demons and said things that weren't as harsh to the demons as he says to the Pharisees. Jesus confronted a Roman official named Pontius Pilate who was one of the most brutal murderers of his time. And he had less harsh things to say for Pontius Pilate than he does for these Pharisees. Uh, Jesus confronts his betrayer, Judas, and has less harsh words for Judas than he does for these Pharisees. So we need to kind of understand why this was such a difficult confrontation for Jesus. Why 
at first he wants to call them out of it, but there's, there's real anger here. There's real animosity for what these people are doing. Let me take you to a couple of verses that might explain this. By the way, if, you, if, you have, if you've never heard Jesus speak to the Pharisees, Matthew chapter 23, the whole chapter is Jesus, and it's almost, it's really difficult to read because we don't usually hear Jesus like this. And, and we need to understand that he has reserved words for these people that no other people got recorded in God's word. Let me give you just a sample from Matthew 23, picking up in verse 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. And, and what he's going to say is you've, you've elevated these little things, giving a tenth of your spices, and you've put them on top of the things that are really of the heart that matter. You've got your priorities wrong. And not only do you have your priorities wrong, you've actually neglected the things that are more important because you've elevated these. See, these things are observable. You can weigh out your spices and make sure you give a ten tenth of them. You can, you can take your checkbook and you can give a tenth of your dollars to something and someone. And for some of us, we grew up believing that that was the right thing to do. And, and God is saying, you know, that's fine, but don't, don't elevate that above love of man, mercy, faithfulness justice. These things are more important. And this is going to be the lesson for today for these Pharisees that Jesus is going to do. But he goes on after that and he says, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How's that? Right? How will you escape being condemned to hell? This is Jesus talking to these people. So what we need to understand is however much he loves them and wants to call them out of this mistake they're making, He's not going to let them steer his other beloved children away. And you, as, a, as, as some of us as parents, know what that would feel like. It's a very protective instinct here. And let me, let me tell you, you know, we, we've offered this idea that the most important thing is not so much that we obey a checklist of rules, but that we have a relationship with Jesus. I want to offer you a scripture, and I want, I want to make sure if you or anyone you love is struggling with that idea, will you direct them to Matthew chapter 7 for just a moment? Listen to these words. These are some of the most dangerous and maybe kind of frightening words in the whole Bible. So I hope you're buckled up for that. But it's, it goes like this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? Not everyone who thinks they're in obedience with the Lord is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and did we not drive out demons and perform miracles? And then Jesus will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Do you hear the operative word? Here's the things you've done. You did this, you did this, you did this, and those all seem like great things. I don't care. Your list of achievements goes completely unrecognized because I never knew you. And this is a good challenge right now. Brothers and sisters, does the Lord know you? When you will, as we all will, stand before him one day, will he say, I know you, come here. Or will he say, you know, everything you did, nothing. I don't know who you are, and you don't know me. And the word know here is more than just understand your resume and the hairs on your head and your cellular structure. It implies an intimacy. And this is important that we make sure we understand this, and I... I will, I, I will never tire of telling the world, relationship matters more than rules. And this is proof of it right here from Jesus. And then the scariest part of this is he goes on, he says, I will tell them plainly, I, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And that's the part of this that is kind of scary. You see, people that think that their checklist of doo-doos, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, earned them favor with God, are not only mistaken, they're actually doing evil according to the authority of Jesus Christ. Not mine. I would never have the temerity to do that. But according to the authority of Jesus Christ right there, that's what's going on. So I hope we understand now. These Pharisees, Jesus is going to take them on in a way that is loving, caring, hoping some of them will respond, but with an understanding that they're actually leading his people astray. 
How many people do you know have been led astray by the idea that there's some checklist, some bucket list of things they do that earn them favor with God? And that's sad, and this is wrong. Now, we know there's a few of the Pharisees that actually hear and come out of that. Nicodemus is one. So this is not an effort that's in vain. So Jesus is going to go on, and he's, gonna, he's going to teach them, right? But this is why he's so harsh with them. I hope that makes sense. So he's orchestrated an event, right? In, in chapter 5, you know, he healed people, and then the Pharisees asked him, this is much more proactive. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain and rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Now, let's just talk about that for a minute. There's a lot of things in it. First of all, this idea of the Sabbath. The word literally means rest. That's what it means. When you hear the word Sabbath, or in Hebrew now it's Shabbat, right? that word means rest. That's all it has ever meant, and that's all it is meant to mend, meant to have meant. Right? And the whole idea is what, what these Pharisees did, because they worshipped rules, they added things to what God said. We talked about this with fasting. God ordained fasting when you're in extreme sorrow, which most of us know. There are times when you're in such extreme sorrow, you're not hungry, you're fasting. But he also ordained one day a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that the nation of Israel fast. The Pharisees turned it into twice a week because if one is good, two is better. And we earn more points. Our pinball machine must just be rolling over in God's eyes. And it's not true. But what they did with the Sabbath was even worse. It's, it's almost funny if it isn't sad, that they took what God ordained and added so many rules on top of them that it's, it, and by the way, it still continued today. Now, I want to give you some examples of it. But the Sabbath meant this. According to Exodus 20, this is the best description of the Sabbath, it was a God-ordained day of rest. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Exodus 20, beginning in verse 8. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, a rest to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And this is the institution of the Sabbath. Let's make sure we understand this is a good principle. The principle is, do you trust the Lord not to take a day off of work? Do you trust that the Lord will provide for you because of your work in six days? This is kind of embarrassing for me because I work two jobs, right? And so, so this is one of those things where uh, it, the idea of observing a rest, a Sabbath rest, is, is a good principle. It's an idea of recognizing that God is going to provide for me so much that I can actually take a day and do nothing but rest it's interesting, that institution goes all the way back to creation. And it goes back to creation not because God was tired. Right? He didn't create the world in six days and goes, wow, man, I'm beat. Right? The, according to Isaiah, the Lord does not grow weary. Right? So he, he adds a day for our benefit that says, look, yeah, this, let's take a day and rest. I, I, you know, I work in a school. Um, and I've learned a lot of things from interfacing with really good teachers and very bright children. Uh, yeah, they're dangerous sometimes, they really are. Um, but I remember one time I was sitting in an art class, and the teacher was explaining something to me, and she kind of leaned over and she says, see, these kids here are making a terrible mistake. And it's hard because young artists do this, they keep thinking they should add more and add more. So she's got a beautiful backdrop here, but she's gonna add another tree, and she's gonna add a dog, and she's gonna add a fire hydrant, and before too long, it's gonna actually be cluttered. And the reason is because we don't know what God knows, which is when to say, that's good. Let's stop right there. And during creation, he did that six times, and he even stopped and took a break. Right? And as artists, sometimes what we leave out, <laughs> it accentuates what we put in. And this is, this is what this lady taught me, and I thought, man, what a great lesson around Genesis and creation. And, and this is it. The Sabbath rest. It's a time when we relax. Good principle, okay? Now, do you know what the Pharisees did with that good principle? Uh, they took 25 volumes of rules of what constitutes work. And that was in Jesus' day. It was 25 volumes. 
And some of the teachers of the law that he's referring to spent their entire life writing volumes and studying these volumes so that they knew how to define work. And this is, this is honestly, this is ridiculous. This is taking rule worship too far. And, and, and just to give you an example of things that are still today, and, and please hear me, I, I love the Jewish brethren. I have high hopes that from what I read in the Old Testament, God has a plan for those people that worshiped before Jesus, Yahweh, okay? And, and I, I, but what some of them have done to Sabbath rules, I can only say is ridiculous. Let me, let, we've talked about the elevator. I don't know if you realize, some of you have been to Israel or you've been to an Orthodox neighborhood in New York where they, on, from sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday, they take the elevator and they come along and they put it into Sabbath mode. And the reason they do is because, see, if I live on the fifth floor of my apartment building, uh, pressing the button to get the elevator, that's work. And I can't do that. And then when I get on the elevator, if I press the button five, that's work again that I've done. And that's wrong. See, by the way, Jesus, there were no elevators back in that time, just to make sure that we're clear about that. Right? He had his ups and downs, but there were no elevators. How's that? Thank you. I'm here through Sunday. Um, Without the drummer, these just are not as good. Um, Sammy's like, yeah, you're right, they're not, they're not. So we rehearse them with the drums, and it just, okay. But in addition to the Sabbath elevator, can we, can, does, that, does that make sense? I mean, those of us with our eyes open look at that and go, that's ridiculous. So you, you just wait, and you walk on an elevator, and then it magically opens up at every floor, and you get off on five, and you can now say, I've done no work. No. Listen to what a website, this is an orthodox website called aish.com, A-I-S-H, that's a Hebrew word for fire. You want to go there and you want to read this. this. This might make you laugh, it might make you cry. This is concerning the Sabbath and toilet paper. <laughs> Things that are attached through glue, sewing, I'm quoting, okay? Things that are attached through glue, sewing, or even perforation, cannot be unattached for the purposes of Shabbat. This would involve taking something in one form and carefully dividing it up into another for some use, thus creating something anew. That's work, and paper towels also fall into this category. You, you get that? By tearing apart perforated towels, you're doing work, and that's not allowed. Okay, now this is what's interesting to me. Some people say, well, you know, what's wrong with that? If I'm, if I, if someone... It's just a little bit misguided, and they, through their own sacrifice and their own conscience, want to devote this sacrifice to the Lord. I may know that it doesn't really gain them points, but what, what are they hurting with that? Listen to what the website says next. Here's how you get around this, how to approach it. Pre-tear your toilet paper ahead of time. You, you're laughing. That's, I mean, I'm not kidding. Or use tissues, right? And for paper towels, pre-tear what you need. Now, do you understand? This is not bring glory to God. These are people, when there are rules, when you worship rules, you can find loopholes. That's what they've done. This website tells you the most miserable day of the week is Sabbath because of all the things you can't do, but here's how you get around them. Do you really believe you've devoted your heart to God by doing that? And the answer is no, of course not. We see that with our eyes open and some of us are like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Right? I'm going to step on an elevator and pretend it just magically took me to the fifth floor? I'm going to tear ahead of time my toilet paper, and now I'm in good right standing with God. Right? There's so many jokes I had for that that I'm just not going to tell. Okay? I'm not. But there's a lot that I could, and I'm showing as much restraint as I have right now. But I, hear what's going on. When we worship rules, instead of worship the God of the rules, when we value the rules higher than the relationship, when we put counting our spices ahead of justice and mercy, this is the kind of, just frankly, idiocy that comes out of that. And there are thousands of years of this that's built up. Back in Jesus' day, there were 25 volumes. Now, who knows how much. So I want to make sure we understand. When we say Sabbath, these people had put a whole bunch of rules on top of what the real meaning was. And, and, and Jesus knows that. Jesus actually liked to pick on these guys during the Sabbath. I, I guess it's probably wrong to say pick on. That was, that's what I do, because I'm a sinful man, and I'm a smart aleck, right? Okay? 
was like, I'm just confessing it, right? Like, you're laughing, you're like, right, like we didn't know. <laughs> Jesus isn't that way, but he is. He, every week, he's got a Sabbath day to illustrate the absurdity by being himself absurd, and that's what he's doing here. He says, you know, um, you guys have elevated so many of these little rules. And by the way, God never said anything about toilet paper. God never said anything about elevators. God never said anything about rubbing your hands together as work making grain. They said that. Those are man-made rules. What God actually did say in Deuteronomy 23, this is fun, I know many of your Bible studies don't take you to Deuteronomy very often, but in Deuteronomy 23, there's, a, there's like a welfare rule that's put in place for Israelites. It says this, Deuteronomy 23, verses 24, 25, if you want to study this. If you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat all the grapes you want, but do not put any in your basket. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hand, but you must not put a sickle to the standing grain. And what this was was, look, if you're hungry, eat, but don't take. Right? Don't, don't take because that's like for commercial purposes. But when you're hungry, go eat, and you're allowed to do that. So you go eat all the grapes you want because hunger, people, are more important than rules. But if you, like, eat and then take a whole basket with you, that's wrong. That's the Jewish rule for welfare right there. You can go into somebody that's got grain. You can pick some and you can eat it. Because when you're starving, your survival is more important than our rules. Right? And this is what's going on. And so Jesus is setting them up for a contrast between what God actually said about going through grain fields from Deuteronomy with the rules that were man-made. And silly. Okay? By the way, just even in the time of Jesus, they had silly rules that he liked to take on. One of them was that you couldn't mix water and dirt together to make clay because that would be work. And even if you spit into the ground and stirred it with your finger, you were making clay and that's wrong. Okay? That was work. Which is another reason why on a Sabbath when Jesus was healing a guy who was blind, he spit in the dirt and mixed it with his finger as if to say, you know, you guys, how about that, right? And th I'm sorry, that's the way I do it. Right? I mean, but there's some of these things in the Bible that Jesus did along with this, and what he's doing is he's specifically taking on some of these Sabbath rules. This is one of those times. Now, I, I hope that you understand that if you, most of you have seen stalks of wheat and stuff. I, I lived in Kansas for eight years, and you know, it's, I had a wheat field in my backyard. It really is kind of cool. When it's starting to get ripe, you can actually just go, and it'll come off right in your hand. And the wheat is, is a kernel. It's like a seed, and it has an outer covering, and if you rub it, that outer covering will come off, and you can actually blow on it a little bit and some of that will blow away and what's left is really what you want all the nutrients just like a sunflower seed right you know it, it, it's a little bit like that and that's what they're doing that's what the the disciples are doing and do you understand so jesus is intentionally putting them in this spot right and what he's trying to figure out is he's saying are, are you guys you you pharisees are you really going to elevate these people who are hungry who are eating in a way that God has allowed specifically according to Deuteronomy, are you really going to elevate your own rules above that? And their response, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And that tells us where they live. That tells us right where they live. See, and they know this Deuteronomy verse. Let's make sure we understand. It's not like Jesus has to remind them of Deuteronomy. That's the way we do it. We'd be quoting Deuteronomy back to them. They know it full well. They think that's actually subordinate to their rules. That's the problem. Does that, does that make sense? So Jesus is going to go on and he's going to tell them a different story. He's going to say, do you remember, you guys have your priorities wrong on this. Do you remember, uh, have you never read what David did when his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and taking the consecrated bread, he had what is lawful only for the priests. And he also gave some to his companions. And this story is in 1 Samuel 26. If you want to read it, it's kind of an interesting story. David's on the run. He stops. He gets this bread. They used to bake bread once a week. They'd put fresh bread on the altar, and they'd take the old stuff. And it was, you'd think, old bread? But you see, it was without leaven, so it was probably just dried out more like a cracker or a crouton, right? And that belonged to the priests. That was the edict. So, but one of the priests, when David was passing through, said, here, I just took this stuff off the altar. You guys have it. And, and Jesus is saying, do you, do you understand what, what was more important here? David was on a mission from God according to Jake and Elwood, right? Yeah, right? I'm glad somebody watched that movie in 1980 with me. Okay? 
Mark's account of this incident adds a sentence that clears it all up for me. Remember, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are giving the same accounts of this particular incident of Jesus walking through the grain fields. Listen to Mark's account. It's in Mark chapter 2. It begins in verse 25. He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Mark's telling us the same story. In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he, David, entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Sound the same? Mark adds this word right here. Then he said to them that Jesus said to the Pharisees, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And that, all of a sudden now, all the tumblers should unlock in our mind because Jesus is explaining, this is not. These, these rules were made to help people, not people made to uphold rules. That's what he's telling. Does that make sense? Isn't that beautiful? Mark helps us there understand what Luke was telling us. That the Sabbath was made for man. Man's more important. Not man for the Sabbath. And then he goes on in what could only be described as a mic drop. Okay? Ask your kids what that means. He drops a bomb on them when he then says to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, If you're a Pharisee and you're listening to him say that, what you would hear is, this Sabbath you've been adding the rules to? This was my idea in the first place, and I have the right to change it. I'm God. Uh, that's what I'm saying. This is why this is like a mic drop for them. Oh my gosh. No wonder they, they tried to kill him. No wonder. Don't let anyone tell you Jesus didn't claim to be God. One of the 80 times he did is right here. Right here. The Son of Man is an image from the book of Daniel. Daniel has a vision of the end of the, er- end of the earth. And he sees someone that is a man, but has all the authority of God mixed together, and he doesn't understand it. And he calls that figure the Son of Man. And and Jesus' favorite title for himself is that figure, a man with all the authority and power of God, the Son of Man. He uses it more to describe himself than any other title. The Greeks had a term, theanthropos, which means the God-man. And that's really what Jesus is. So the Son of Man was Daniel not understanding how can a man have all the authority of God. Jesus said, that's, that's me. And so he says to these guys, this, I made the Sabbath. I invented it for man, and you guys have messed it up. This was my idea, right? And that, that had to just fry them, right down to their sandals or socks or whatever they wore. So this is one of those times as we conclude for today, and it's really easy. This is one of those things I could rant about all day. And I guess we could collectively probably agree, what a bunch of fools. But there's a reason that this has survived for 2,000 years in God's Word. And it isn't just so we can look back on how foolish they were. These ideas are meant for our own instruction. So part of this to me is, how do we apply this to ourselves? And, and, and I think that's, that's the thing that we need to do with verses like this. It's real easy in these five verses to, to, to listen to this and think, wow, I see their mistake. But do we see anything that we're doing ourselves? And this is where I really want to challenge you. I want, I want to challenge you to ask God to, to show you gently, not in a way that's like car crash, but show you gently how maybe you've got rules mixed above you got some priorities out of whack and the number one priority is your relationship with him is there anything that you're doing that's standing in the way of that right let's just start right there and that's convicting and that's very personal and i know all week actually two weeks now the lord has been showing me things that i have done that have, i've elevated uh, you know the collecting of the spices above the more weightier things of the law so as we conclude today, instead of just making fun of these people, let's use this, understand God wants this illustration to quicken our hearts. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the rest that you've created that we have in you. Whatever day of the week it is, we have rest in you, and we thank you for that. But Father, rather than just all agree how awful and stupid these Pharisees are, we know that you actually gave us this illustration so that we could be warned, so that we could know. And so, Father, I ask that you, as as a favor to your loving people, would show us gently ways in which we have put one rule in the wrong priority above another. 
And that the most important thing, Father, is our relationship with you. And would you continue to strengthen that in every heart that beats in this room today? And we give you thanks and praise in advance, knowing that you will do that in Christ's name. Amen.